All right, more. And what is this explanation? You have this interpretability, you have this explainability, are they the same? So my, my personal preference of what is the explanation is basically Lewis's work. <coughs> he's, a, he's a philosopher, and he's graduated at Harvard. And he says that in active explaining, someone who's in, uh, possessed of, uh, some information about a causal history of some event uh, tries to convey it to someone else. And to me, uh, I think that this causal history basically is the cornerstone of interpretability. I don't mean that it's been addressed yet. I'm just saying that this is very important. And the same paper by Doshi Velas, they actually say that the, there is no explanation. There is no uh, definition of explanation. So there is a disagreement whether this definition is actually correct. And uh, in Miller's paper, which I refer to a lot in this talk, he actually mentions that explanations are not associations. They're completely different. Some attribution. Two things I need to mention is that what is a causal history? Causal history is a chain of event that happens until we have the, the event at the end that you want to like explain. So why are you late? Because I got up late <coughs> in the morning, then there was a bus that was late, and therefore I'm, so you have the whole, whole causal history. An explanation in a sense, in at least what Lewis says, is not this whole you know story. It's not just that, it's more. Are explainability and interpretability are like interchangeable terms? Yes and no again. Some people like Miller, they say they're the same. Some people like Gilkin, they're like, no, you have two layers of explainability. The first layer is that you explain everything completely, so that's what they call explainability. And in interpretability, you kind of like summarize things in an understandable way. So you have two layers of abstraction. And they say that interpretability, because it's an approximation of the original event, it's not very um, <coughs> sexy. <laughs> or whatever. It's not very attractive. And also, you have more definitions in other papers as well. There are a lot of papers who define their own terms. So then, in this one, it, they actually say that explanation and interpretability are very close, close together. But that, that basically means that if, it, if an operation is can be understood by the user. Okay. There will be a lot of these uh, definitions, but less now. But then, what is the need for explanation? Again, there's like tons of literature, everybody's saying something, some people is saying it's trust, some people, is, there's a lot of things, it's really hard to say what is the, like, the point of this, this whole field of studying humans. But here are the handpicked ones I picked. It's for humans to learn from the intelligent agent, basically. It's also for, for humans, I love this one, for humans to drive stable models of the world to be able to control and predict. That's actually Heider, another philosopher. And this is also, these three are from the Miller's paper. So for humans to filter out the chain of causal belief, because the chain can grow in complicated environment, there could be many events contributing to the same event, eventually. And this, these two are really tricky, but actually for the intelligent agent to persuade the user, if you have a, if you have a choice to listen to your car's computer, or actually drive by your own instinct, so you can actually use the expression to persuade. And actually for an authority to blame, to place the blame on whether who's, who's at fault, basically. Okay, so far it's boring, right? <laughs> All right, so what's the need for interpretability? There are, again, everybody's saying something. Some people say trust, some people say it's fairness, some, I mean, there's so many things. Like, the hand-picked one I, I, I hand-picked here was that one of them is that it's incomplete in probable formulation. When you, for example, you want to save patients, and yet at the same time you want to not be biased to do like to the back to their background, to racial background, for example. You can't write it down. There are too many objectives at the same time to optimize. So uh, Bellas and Kim actually in their paper they all argue that that's the only reason when you want to have interpretability. And in Brian and Cotton. They basically say the need is basically because you want to find the cause of a decision. And this cause comes a lot of times in this presentation, this cause, which is actually hard to measure. But one of the things I really like in this Miller paper, which is actually not paper, like 60 pages, it's a good book. But he, he mentions that any trusted autonomous system that generates decision, actually during the computation, call it in machine learning training, 
it actually needs to consider whether he's doing something that a human can understand or not as a measure. So if, if you're training with stochastic gradient descent and we don't know what that is, that actually not a trusted agent because we don't really know how the optimization works. And then he said, okay, but after that you reach a decision, then you should also explain the decision. So it's two level, while computing all the time and after you've made a decision. So there are two levels. And what he says is that most people are actually like focusing on the second one. When you have a decision, when you have an output, and then you want an explanation for it. My thoughts, my personal thoughts, is, is close to what APA wrote, like 1995. Is that really, like to me, interpretability cannot be separated from intelligence. So if we're doing artificial intelligence, just like their definition of intelligence, I think it's actually to, one part of intelligence is to engage in various forms of reasoning, and engagement is with explanation and communication. You can't engage by yourself. And what Lipton is saying also in his paper about interpretability is that inconveniently, he says, many situations are there that the world objectives are actually cannot be like modeled as a function. So in most cases, you need interpretability, basically what he said. In most cases, you don't, can't just measure an objective, you have more things to consider. Uh, at the end, sometimes the movie, in the movies, the first shot, they show something from the end of the movie. And then the, during the rest of the time, then the, the director tries to like keep the people engaged. That's what I'm trying to do here. What is the state of uh, interpretability research? If you want to say it very harshly, like Miller, it's inmates running the asylum. And what he means is that you know you have this crazy hospital and crazy people are running it. Uh, what he means is basically you have a lot of computer scientists, they come up with these ideas, they call it interpretable, they say it works perfectly fine. Uh, I'm not going to mention papers yet. Uh, and then they say this is interpretable and they leave it there. And two years later, there's going to be another method. So that's what he said, basically, this research is about that. And him again, I think this is, is much like more polite, maybe, about the field, that it's the solution to explainability is not just more AI and computation. So you can't solve it by adding more automation. Because you have a lot of, I don't know, master's students at KTH, you have a lot of people say, how do I automate this process? It's like, you can't, because at the end, it's a human and agent interaction problem. And uh, this Dallas and Kim's uh, quote is about interpretability, but I think it applies very much also to deep learning. That the claim of the research should match the type of evaluation. We talk about evaluation later. And again, Lipton says that you have so many conferences, publications stating that this is interpretable, and yet uh, there's no way to actually formulate it.
um, in three levels. So, you, so they say, okay, so you have an interpretable model, you show it to real humans with real tasks. For example, you want to diagnose cancer, you show it to real doctors. <coughs> so that's one way of evaluation. You have another way of evaluation, also involving humans, this, this is involving humans, of course, where it, it's real humans, like, evaluating, but the task is simplified. And then you have what they call functionally grounded evaluation, that are proxy tasks that basically is like, mathematical or like computational. So how do we go about evaluating this? This looks funny in a way because you, you, I don't think I've seen a lot of papers actually talking about different ways of evaluation. But the earlier quote basically says, if you have, if you come up with a method, please tell how does it, how have you evaluated it? Like how, how was this measured? What is it, what is it gonna work? Um, yeah, so also this Gilpin paper, it's more it's mostly about neural networks. But they basically say that you should not evaluate even an interpretable model only in interpretable settings. You should also like measure its performance. You should you should evaluate on a range. I think it's an important thing here to know that you don't you can't just say, oh, I came up with this really simple thing and yeah, it works. You have to actually compare the performance to a much more complicated opaque quote unquote model. Uh, so here it starts with, a, I'm trying to do like a tutorial, so I'll show up like several things and ask a lot of questions. I'll, I'll, I'll bring more like information, but during this talk we're going to look at a census data set. It's a very old benchmark data set, it's a youth UCI repository. It's very simple. The task is to predict whether an individual earns more than 50k or not. Here. That's very simple. And these are the features included. You have, there was no GDPR back then for sure. You have like race, <laughs> sex, capital gain, financial status, and occupation, and, and actually this weird thing that they have produced in the original paper. And there's a disclaimer. There is ethics of data, you can't do that, okay? This is a benchmark. We're talking about it, we're seeing it at just, uh, you know, a benchmark data set, and this is actually used a lot in fairness, uh, fairness data sets. I actually talked to some of you to get like, all right? So don't think too much into this. All right. I have, uh, how much time is it? You have until 50, 20 minutes. 20 minutes. I, I, so I'm going to talk about three, this, when I had the agenda, there are three layers of interpretability. I don't necessarily agree with this kind of category, but it goes like this. Interpretability before training your model, when training your model and after you train your model. So I'm following something like that. And in each of them, I'll talk one or two examples and give you some perspective of how to use it, yeah? So before you actually train any model or anything, you do need to a lot of do visualization. I would call it exploratory analysis, but now it's cooler to call it like before model interpretability. I don't know. To me, it's just like visualizations and those things. When there's no model, you want to look at things. And uh, maybe at the end, if I have time, I'll go through the example. But I, I've actually started to look with this Google What If tool, which was very hot and was very popular, like fairness, it was everywhere. And I started to like play around a bit with it. I'm not really like impressed uh, that much because it's a rebranding of an earlier tool Google had is called Google Faucet. Um, it actually is compatible with TensorFlow estima Estimators, which is the higher level abstraction, and it cares. It has support for Jupyter and TensorBoard. If you're using the TensorBoard, you need to only use TF Records objects and TensorFlow Serving API, so you can't use otherwise. Um, and then it has like counterfactual reasoning that it had so much problems with to getting it work for other models, so it was a quite buggy experience. I think Nikhil is going to talk a little bit about it, hopefully. Because it was very buggy, I couldn't really get, get something out. It has fairness, fairness measures, like democratic parity. You can actually see those things in the TensorFlow. So if you're interested, I think it's pretty interesting. But the tool is a bit like lack of documentation as usual with TensorFlow. It's kind of weird. This whole thing. But Faucet is pretty stable, so if you want to use Faucet, I, I highly recommend it. All right. Um, so we're going to go into the, the part where you actually start. So this is like, basically is this. 
you want to do automation, you want to do decision making, but your main goal is interpretability because you you have users, you know, you have stakeholders. From the start, you really care about users first, kind of. Uh, but there's not so much rigorous research on this neither, but what we know is that, for example, from Lipton's paper, that what, it, what do we call like an interpretable model is that it's transparent, as in, in a way, a human can understand how it works. And also, not only that you can see how it works, but it's decomposable. Like, in a way, you can take parts, part of the model and say, this part does this, this part does that, basically. Uh, he also mentioned some post hoc, like after training methods that we talk about later. Uh, there are certain models that come from a class, class that people say they are interpretable. Uh, they're not, honestly. Uh, rules. I'll, I'll show you. I'll prove this to you that they're not interpretable by default. I, I don't think they're any more interpretable than anything else. Let's start with logistic regression. It's a, it's a, it's called regression, but it's a classification. And uh, let's start with logistic regression. Basically, this is the form. Those of you who don't know the math, just forget about it. Don't need to read the, this part, okay? Basically, you have data that has dimensions, and for each dimension, you get importance. So if I'm an individual, and for example, my, like, I'm, like, whatever, age, uh, like, age is, like, factor two plus. So it actually multiplies that, that weight to that feature. Of me, yeah. So that's how it works. Um, if you use this is like if you use this, then you're like a kid. No one looks at you now in AI. If you like, I, if you say like I use logistic regression, you can't have an AI startup. It's like you're dead. <laughs> it's like really basic stuff. And Lane is like second quarter, like second lecture is like logistic regression. You don't want to talk about it even because it's so simple. If you benchmark this very roughly without hyperparameter tuning, without going crazy. You get something like 78% accuracy on census, <coughs> predicting this over 50k <coughs> salary, under 50k, right? It's like 78 78%. And what you do in logistic regression and log regression is you use something that is called odds. Whatever that factor that I said, the, that weight of that feature is, you make an exponential of that and you use that next to the feature's multiplication, like the feature value. Use that as a quote unquote interpretation. All right? So now comes the first user study we're going to have. I want to show you three features their weights, the factor, and then the odds. And I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to give you an example of a person and say whether he's earning above or under 50k per year based on those. And I'll help you in the first one, but I'll help you less than that. And whenever I say, like, is this earning fit over, and then you're again. Not bad. Okay, so this is the weight. There is, so the age has 7,000 plus as a weight, so it contributes 7,000. Uh, educate, number of years of education in university, 2,000, and the race being black, minus 99. And because of the odds, one of the problems you get with odds calculation, you get infinity. You can't really say much about infinity. It's like you don't get much information. So you kind of ignore it. And with race life, you get a very low odd, right? So the question is, does a female 40-year-old, 43-year-old applicant, having studied nine years in university, earn more than 50K according to this model? This is the explanation, and this is the input. If this is a good explanation, you, you got all, all of you got to get it right. And I want to test it. Who thinks here that this person earns more than 50K? She doesn't. So maybe one third of people thought. This is the most simple data set. Yeah? No one looks at this. It's so old, 1993. But is odds just an exponential of This is, this is the most simple model, the most simple data set you can find. It's not interpretable. Okay, let's, follow, let's continue. Decision trees. Everybody tells everybody else decision trees are very interpretable because first, they're hierarchical, they have a graphical structure, they have like a subset of attributes, not all of them, so you don't have to look at everything. And then they have hierarchy, 
And in decision tree, the, the higher the known feature is, like close to the root, the better, like the more important the feature is. And there's this saying that you can't find it anywhere that a, a tree that has depth, like from the from the roots, you go three down, is very interpretable. That's like the saying. I actually looked up the paper. Paper doesn't say three. Someone came up with this, and there's no real rigor for this. Would you say that the first model is not interpretable? Like, in what sense do you mean oh, by the one that you use? Thank you. you repeat the question in the mic? Yes. So, but when I say that it's not interpretable with regards to what situation, based on the explanation that you get. So maybe there are other ways of explaining this, not with odds and not with ways directly. Because the, the, go, the, the saying goes in interpretability that, oh, by the way, the linear models, if you use a little bit of like three features, they're very interpretable. No, they're not. They, they, all, depend, they all depend on the context. But are you saying that being able to predict from a description is interpretability? Because it's two different yeah, things, right? Yeah. Because you're actually asking us to predict something from a model. Yes, what we're doing here is actually, <coughs> yeah, so this type of user testing, uh, someone's asking, it, is this interpretability? Yeah, this is for forward prediction. If you have an input and an explanation, you should be able to predict what's coming next, if it's, it's explainable. And I mean, we're talking about, I, I haven't counted like your background. This is not a real user study. It's just a showing, it's a demo of what happens when you go to users on a setting and ask them whether this is interpretable or not. And you guys are mostly, I assume, that highly educated people, so there's a bias there. But even so, it's, I just want to like, show you that it's not like, oh, yeah, it's very interpretable. Everything works fine. In human grounded metrics, I'm showing you a simplified task in your real, right? Uh, so, it's, uh, so it's the second type of evaluation of the forward prediction. Now, other ways. You have binary force choice. You show two explanations and you say which one's better. Good that you point out, because I, I actually skipped this part. Or you have counterfactual simulation. You say, how do I change this so that this person, this black female applicant, is over 50? You have different ways, but this is very simple, so I wanted to do something very simple. Did I answer all questions? Yeah. Uh, does it matter if, if you have, because in the example, your input and the uh, weighting, or I mean, you have the input of the gender, but you don't have the input of race. Yeah, that was kind of like to confuse you. Then you repeat the question. The, the, yeah, basically the input, I'm adding more information to the input, and that's intentional. I just want to like, kind of overload your cognitive ability here to keep track of certain things. So we also don't have input on the rates. What? Oh, I said it, but I didn't write it. It was a black thing mm -hmm. I actually compiled these on the bus. <laughs> <laughs> I was late. Yeah, sorry. This, this was, yeah, so this is interpretable if I, if I mentioned it was black, right? Yeah. Or, we'll see. There are more issues. <laughs> All right, so this is basically what, what I don't have rigor here to say. Some people say it's, it's true. This is how a decision tree looks. This is the root node, and then there's a condition. If it's true or false, it goes different ways. Okay? This is how it works. Right? This is how you read it. And uh, this is depth three, so you say one, two, three. And you can't read this. It's just to show that it has a graph for a presentation. It's pretty easy. So you go left is true, right is false. And then you have condition here, it's called education number less than 12 and a half. And then you say false, this is true, and this is false. You go all, all the way down, and here you have the class that you read. Say, okay, this is under 50. You can't read it, sorry. But you can, what? What happened here? Yeah. All right, so weird thing. Okay, so I, I went, wrote this down in my code, if and else, and I have a question here. So you do the same thing. You actually read this and then answer this. Does an applicant with six years of education, zero capital gain, earn more than 50K? Capital gain is like you have a property, right? And a lot of people in this data set don't have a property really because they're applying for loans and stuff. So this is very, it's very usual. So looking at this, do you think that this person earns less or more than 50K? Sorry? Oh, sorry. Yes. Oh my God. Uh, wait a second. This person is not mad. So marital status 
says it's either zero or one. If you get one, you, you're over. Halfway. Raise your hand and it's over. Raise your hand if it's over. Some people. Yeah, it's true, it's under So so in this in this for this audience it seems that people get decision trees better. Or maybe just because tired, people are tired to raise their hand. <laughs> This is just to show how do you measure interpretability, and it's, it's a very hard task. It's very, very time-consuming and annoying. I mean, AI is about removing people. This is about bringing people in. It's kind of like, we wanted to get rid of people, and I'm going to bring them back. All right, how much time do you have? Okay, I'm kind of on time. Uh, I have some questions here. If you answered this right, was it because you understood the data or the model? Because model actually was not 100% accurate. Or did you just think for yourself? Did you even pay attention? These are the questions like it's hard to ask. Whether people actually pay attention to the explanation or just like, hmm, I think not. These are the things that are fuzzy and it's un un impossible to measure in interpretability. <coughs> and I wanted to ask you this to think about it, how it works. Uh, yeah. This is the last part. When you have a model, you have a lot of approaches. When you have a trained model and everything else, uh, you can actually find approaches to explain some things, some things more. Uh, I'm not a favor of these approaches because I study them. I think they're very hacky. And uh, I wanted to talk about my research. Unfortunately, I can't because I don't have time. But it's really hard to benchmark these ones. Extremely, extremely hard. Okay. Here, I'm, I'm going to show you some pictures. They're actually quite, they're so funny that I actually have to write down the predicted class so that I don't forget them. Right, this is an inception model running images, and the, the underlying approach is called line. That's very popular. I think everybody talks about this line. Uh, yeah, let's see. Okay, so this is an image. I love uh, nature. Uh, this is an input image, and this is an explanation hit by line. What I want you to do is do the exact same thing. It's an image with classification, so you don't have to say what type of thing there is, just saying what it is. Uh, what, are, what are the possible classes? What are the possible classes of predictions? Image names. Okay. Yeah. Well, so I, I, maybe not everybody's familiar with image names. No, no, no. Just the category. Yeah? So I don't want you to go, like, I've written this down, I don't know how to pronounce these kind of classes. But based on your gut feelings or what you see, if you see these two, yeah, what would be the class type, for example? Elephant? Yeah? It's a combination block. Combination block. Block. Yes. <laughs> it's predicted by by two percent. It's not a good explanation of how the problems of crime is is Lyme good as yeah. you see here the problem of these kind of methods, from the models, for these kind of models. Uh, I, okay, so you you mentioned that isn't Lyme good that actually shows the focus of the neural network? Yeah, the focus of the neural network and how problematic neural networks are actually in the way that they operate and classify. Yeah, I mean, yes, maybe. But I mean, we're seeing it as an explanation to the users here. Yeah, so I would be thinking something like, where I see this, I would think something like, when I see this explanation, that makes me not trust the position on this one, which may be exactly what the explanation is supposed to you do. Mean, yeah. You mean that you look at it, but this is the top five predicted class, still. This is not, I, I didn't pick this up as like some unknown thing. This is the top, you, you give it the yes. classifier. Yes. Sure. That's why it might be interesting. Yeah. Get the explanation. The, I just the say explanation was the full element. Yeah. I would trust it. Yeah. I just pulled your app, I would trust it. Now it looks yeah. just weird. If you see so that, it makes it come up from the image. Right? Okay. I was running a company and I got to somewhere in the first, I would be like, wait a minute. You know, 
I will be very angry. I will say that I disagree with what you're saying. Yeah. Because they're one example. Uh, uh, I, I have very biased and extreme things about life. But can, can I say something? Can we go through different examples and then people will ask the question? Because there will be maybe you'll get answers on the next example. Yes. Maybe? Do you want to wait or do you want to say? I just wanted to ask whether this was the most probable class. Uh, this is the class. second most probable class. Okay, what was the first one then? Uh, I, I actually don't confidence? know. I, I didn't write it down. I think, I think, lock, the combination of yeah. yeah, it was confidence. Confidence. I mean, the confidence on the image was really low in general. But the first one was like 35%, I think. But this is, this is more, this, this one is a bit of like tease. You shouldn't really take it too seriously. There will be more, more because I didn't finish with this because that would be unfair to learn. But I'll show you this one. What about this one? Uh, this is a good explanation about that. Still bad? Hard to say. Hard to say. Yeah. This is actually, this identifies as an elephant this time. But just a little, this. Now it's actually correct. It becomes very correct. It actually explains the top predicted class as, a, as an African elephant. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't disagree. <laughs> I might know my country better. <laughs> okay, so. Alright, I finished up. This is me. This is uni. And this is the explanation. Right? What is the explanation this representing? This is actually now we're going really good predictive. Predictive accuracy, like this. I think it's, this one is seventy percent. What is it saying? This this explanation. He classifies it as a dog with seventy percent. This is Inception V3. Uh, this is not joke. There's code. You go and see. If you change it a little bit like this, what is this now? It's a husky. It's an explanation for the husky. They can't. It, this gets very deep 
feature line, but not necessarily line, but just being a such what a good way of making it transparent. Basically, you have a measure that's been studied called fidelity, that basically says how, fit, how much fidelity does this model have to the original model, right? In, in Lyme's case, you can't really measure that. So usually what you do is that you measure both and you present that to the user saying, this is like I said, I said 70% accurate, this is the model. Or you say the same thing with, that, with, the, with the explanation. There are approaches you can measure, like shop, I think you can measure. Maybe Mikhail will talk more. But anyways, this, this talk is like has no ground because the field is very struggling with definition and stuff. But I think the, the whole point of this talk for me was to, to say that these tools are not real explanations yet. Maybe they're debugging tools, I don't know what to call them. Maybe people in the panel discussion have better names. They're maybe debugging tools, they're maybe, but that they're definitely not interpretable per se. They are maybe a good start, but claiming that we have reached that sort of idea and how, how hard it is to actually explain things to humans in general. I think that what we need to go back to, as, as, a, as a researcher, I, as my own private idea, is like personal idea, is to actually think of causality in the explanation. And also, think about approaches that actually can measure, like you said, measure up the 